So we've talked about uh, a bit already about definitions, differences, uh, and then some practical things for how to share our faith. Um, what we're going to look at in this section um, is to think about key issues with other faiths. And we're going to look at two particular issues. Um, let me ask, let me see here, if I move it over to this. Is it easier for you to see? I don't know how big a screen you have. Is it easier for you to see it like this? Yes. 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 Okay. I can do that. I think I can do that. Here, let me do, let's see here. I can make this smaller, I think. It's smaller. It's so cool. There we go. All right. Let's see if that works. Okay. I feel so technological. Usually nothing ever works for me. And I think I figured this out. Watch as I say that it'll just totally crash. Okay. So as we've got on here, we're going to look at two issues, two groups. Uh, and these are not exclusive to these issues, to these groups. Um, they apply to many other situations. Um, with other religious groups, with other uh, even uh, non-religious groups, questions that people have about Christianity. So I use them here um, to speak to Jehovah's Witnesses and to Islam, but they, they can work in other areas as well. So the first one we're going to look at is the Trinity and using Jehovah's Witnesses kind of as a, as a test case. And then we're going to look at uh, Islam and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, these are Important issues, uh, no matter who you're talking to, but these are especially important for these particular groups. And really, we're thinking about the identity of who God is with the Trinity. And then we're with the resurrection, we're looking at the central event of Christianity. Um, because as Paul says, and we'll see this in a, in a few moments, excuse me, that if Christ is not raised from the dead, we are of all people most pitiable. So that is like the, the real linchpin of Christianity is the... Um, the actual uh, fact of the resurrection from a physical resurrection from the dead um, uh, of Jesus Christ. So we'll get that in a minute, but first we're going to start with the Trinity and the Jehovah's Witnesses view about the Trinity and their view about Christ. Um, so Jehovah's Witnesses, they deny the Trinity. We mentioned that earlier. Um, they are strong monotheists, and they are, they are monotheists, I, and I would call myself a strong monotheist too, but when they use the term monotheistic, um, they understand this, uh, that only the Father is God. Um, anyone else, uh, anything else, is lower than that, is semi-divine or just completely not divine in any way. Um, it's only the Father. Uh, and so this forces them or their interpretation of what does the Bible say about Christ and about the Holy Spirit is that Christ is a created being. We mentioned that um, in the first half. And uh, the Holy Spirit is actually not a person. The Holy Spirit is uh, a, a divine force. Um, um, yeah, it's not an actual uh, person with, with any sort of personal characteristics. Um, and so some of the ways that they get there is uh, by faulty exegetical, uh, faulty interpretations of scripture. But then also it's a, like a self, uh, self-fulfilling self prophecy is because this false interpretation, this problematic interpretation of scripture leads them to mistranslate uh, or to uh, falsely translate several key portions of scripture that feed into um, their uh, false beliefs regarding what scripture says about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and about the Trinity. So I want to just show you an example of this real, real quick of these mistranslations. And if you're ever talking to a Jehovah's Witnesses, to a Jehovah's Witness, you will most likely um, encounter a, a verse like this, because um, as soon as you say, well, I believe Jesus is God, they're going to say, well, let's look at it in, in my Bible. And so in their Bible, in their translation, it's called the New World Translation, John 1.1 1, 1 reads this, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Now, if we compare that to uh, a very common uh, English translation, the ESV, you really could have chosen any English translation, but I chose the ESV. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So can you spot the difference? And the they say it was a God, and, and we say it is God. Yeah, 
hundred percent, hundred percent. Oh, oh, I went too fast. Go back, go back. Uh, there we go. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it. So a, it is a god. So he's not the god. He's a divine sort of individual, um, which actually gets them into trouble in other portions of scripture, um, like John seventeen three, which we might look at later. Um, but in any case, they uh, and this I, way that they translate John one one is totally um, not possible. Like with some trans with scripture, anytime we're taking something from one language like Greek for the New Testament or Hebrew for the Old Testament, and we're conveying it into another language like English, there's always some sort of flexibility. There's some uh, some things that might be uh, different ways that we could translate it. Uh, and so there's different viable translations. That's why we have so many English translations. But this one, is not a viable translation in any way. Um, so it is, uh, there's no justification, no lexical semantic uh, justification for them to translate the word was a God. It's uh, their own sort of presupposition, um, the theologically motivated uh, um, translation and really mistranslation. Now, another example of this is in Colossians 1. Um, where they will highlight that Jesus, this is the go-to verse to highlight that Jesus is a created being and not uh, equal with the Father in terms of his divine essence. And so the uh, New World Translation says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, because by means of all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth. So uh, ESV says this, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Now, there's a couple of different differences. Some are, some are kind of inconsequential, but there's one main difference between these two. Can anyone spot the difference? Our says, for by him all things were created. There says, because by the means of him. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. You're totally right. That is a difference. It's not too big of a difference there. That's not the one I'm looking for. So you get half a point. Um, but uh, yeah, there's another one that uh, is the big one. Uh, all things versus all other things, which excludes himself, which means that he was created by some higher power himself. Yes. Yeah, very good. So that that's the key word, all other things. And so this this highlights this translation, which the word other is not in, in the Greek at all. Um, it is totally, again, unjustifiable uh, translation. It says all things. The word says all things. It means all things. You can't add the word other. Um, and so they want to highlight that he is a created being. So the way that the text reads, like the ESV, it says that he created all things. So how can he be a created being if he creates all things? So it becomes a, uh, a logical theological pretzel. So they try to get around that by inserting the word other, which is totally not what the text has. So they're not willing to listen, at least the translators are not willing to listen to the, the, the thrust of the text. And this feeds into when the Jehovah's Witnesses reading their Bible, it feeds into their uh, problematic theology that goes against what scripture is actually saying. Um, so those are two common verses that you, if you're talking to, to a Jehovah's Witness, you'll most likely uh, encounter. Now, uh, when we look at how do we show who Jesus is and how do we show what the Trinity is and that it's a scriptural uh, concept, even though the term Trinity is not used in scripture. Um, it's, a, it's a later Latin term that was uh, uh, coined, invented in the, I believe, the 200s by Tertullian. Um, you can fact check me on that. I'm not 100% it's Tertullian, but I'm pretty sure it's Tertullian. Um, but the concept is found in scripture. And so if each of the three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they all in scripture have the same titles and action. So this is pointing that there is a unity among them. So what we're going to point out here is that there is both unity and diversity in the Trinity. There's one God, but three 
persons. They are equal in the divine essence, in the divine nature, but they are uh, individual persons. So they're still one God. So monotheistic, but in three, it is revealed in three persons. Um, and so here we see that each of the members of the Trinity, the Father and the Son and the Spirit, have these divine attributes, these divine actions um, uh, or abilities. Attributes is a good word. Um, and then we'll see some titles. Now, there's a much longer list that we could go through, um, but um, trying to condense it. So what I want to do is just look at a uh, quick hit on some of these verses really quickly, just to highlight that each of these um, are um, refer to each member of the Trinity with this sort of attribute. Um, so maybe what we'll do, what do you guys think? Um, maybe if we can just kind of go around and we can hit uh, one verse each as we work through some of these. Does that sound good or not so good? What do you guys think? Okay, cool. So can someone just start? I don't know. I can't really see who's there. So someone just start start the line going around and we'll do Psalm 90 verse 2. Then the next person can do Revelation 1.8. Then the next person can do Hebrews 9.14. And then we have a couple of slides like these. And this is just to illustrate that each member of the of the Trinity seems to have this uh, description attribute ascribed to them in Scripture. So someone, the first person read Psalm 90 verse 2 for us, please. All right, Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, Revelation 1, 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, say the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we have uh, in Psalm 90, uh, God is the Father is described as everlasting. We have Jesus described as the Alpha and the Omega, um, which is describing uh, like uh, not just like a, a literal beginning or a literal end, but like everything in between it. So eternal. And then Hebrews nine fourteen. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offers Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Yeah, thank you. And here you have the spirit is described as not the like began at a certain point, but the eternal spirit. Okay, good. So we see all three members have the divine attribute. Now, the key here, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, the key aspect with the Trinity is we have some key verses that can help show the reality of the Trinity, but it is building a case for monotheism and the diversity of monotheism, that there are these three individuals and all three of them are God. They're not like different facets of one God. They are three persons that are God. So it, we're building a larger case um, from scripture to highlight the Trinity. Um, all right. So that's one aspect of this case. Now, what about holiness? Um, the next person, if you could read Revelation 15, 4, please. That's okay, Romans. I'll take that. Revelations 15.4. We shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Yeah, thank you. And notice that too, like, you alone are holy. And then here in Acts 3.14, notice what it says about the Son. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. Unstable. Yeah. And then uh what about Romans 1 4? Could someone read that, please? And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Yeah, yeah, the spirit of holiness, right? I mean, he is like filled with holiness, right? Yeah. So we see that each member, again, it has uh, this attribute of holiness that is central to who God is. Now, um, again, we are building a larger case. So now what about a title, uh, this description, this uh, 
description of who these individuals are. We see that this divine title is given to each member of the Trinity. So we have Romans 10, 12. Would someone read that for the Father? There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his churches on all who call on him. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good. And then Luke 2, 11 for the Son. Is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Christ the Lord, right? right. Good, good, uh, good Christmas verse, right? But it's showing that he has this title um for that the that the father has as well. And then 2 Corinthians 3:17. The Lord is the spirit, and the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yeah, thank you. So you see again that we're building this case that all uh, all three have the same ascriptions and same attributes, actions, and titles um, that God has. And so there's a much larger body of evidence that we can point to. Um, we're going to point you to a book. Um, named Delighting in the Trinity by Michael Reeves. I have it on a, on a future slide here. Really helpful, short, easy to read, really great book for you to check out about the Trinity. Um, and so here, when we're thinking of um, this aspect of the Trinity, now we can focus specifically on who Jesus is, the deity of the Son. And we see that there are several key passages where the Son is equated with the Father, not in terms of person, but in terms of nature or essence. And so think of John 1.1. 1, 1. We read that already, um, that the word was God. And it's a pretty important passage. It talks about in verse 14 that uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in 17 and 18, it says that he makes the Father known, right? He reveals the Father. Um, in Hebrews 1, it says this, Hebrews 1.3, uh, the, really uh, the, like the whole intro to the beginning of Hebrews is a uh, very strong assertion for the Trinity. It says this in verse 3, he, speaking of Christ, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I notice that language there. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Like God does not give his glory to another. And yet he is the outflowing of that glory to us. Like when we see Christ, we see the Father. We see God because he is God. He is the exact imprint of his nature. And then I love this passage in John 8, 58. I can flip there. Uh, in John 8, 58, Jesus is in this dialogue, this, uh, this argument with the Pharisees, and they are totally not into what he's saying about himself. And they question uh, him, and uh, he, um, they're like, uh, you've seen Abraham? He says, before Abraham was, um, or he says, um, he's talking about that he, he's seen Abraham. And they're like, you're not even 50 years old. Abraham lived hundreds of years ago. How can you have seen Abraham? And then he responds in John 8, 58. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And here, when he uses the term I am, he's using the divine name, the divine title for the one true God of Israel uh, that we see in Exodus 3.14 when Moses is at the burning bush. He says, if I go to Israel and they say, who sent you? What should I say? And God speaks from the burning bush, says, tell them that I am has sent you. Uh, and so here, Jesus is using, this is an echo back to them, and he's just taking that term for the one true God of, Yah, of, the, of Israel, Yahweh himself, he says, I am. And you can see that they don't go like, oh, wow, that's an interesting statement. Like they understand this as a blasphemous sort of statement that Jesus makes in verse 59, which is, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of 
the temple. So John is strongly asserting that Jesus is equal with the Father in terms of his nature. He's ascribing that Jesus is, that Christ is um, God, that the Son is divine. Now, not only do we have the deity of the Son, but we also have the deity of the Spirit. The Spirit is equated with the Father and the Son in terms of nature or essence. Fantastic verse for this is in Acts chapter 5. We're flipping around a lot, sorry for that, but stay with me for just a couple more minutes. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. Um, we have this strange, sad scenario of the sin by uh, two early Christians, Ananias and Sapphira, and they're lying before the apostle Peter uh, about um, uh, selling a field and keeping the money. It says this, verse, verse 3, um, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Okay, so according to verse 3, who did Ananias lie to? Himself. I'm the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you got it. Good catch. Yeah, awesome. Now notice verse 4, because you're going to have an important switch. Verse 4. While it remained unsold, this is just the same same thing that he's saying continued. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So according to verse 4, Peter says, uh, who did Ananias lie to? He's not lying to man, but he's lying to God. Right. But he has just said in verse three that he was lying to the Holy Spirit. So there seems to be, uh, at least it's clear in my mind, that there's this e e equalness between the Holy Spirit in verse three and God in verse four. And so he seems to be equating these two as being the same. So it seems to be a strong assertion that the Holy Spirit himself is divine, is equal with the Father and the Son in terms of the divine essence. We also see going, thinking about uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses view about who the Holy Spirit is, that he's just a, that it's just a, a force. It's like electricity. It doesn't have personality. And you see on the screen there, we have Ephesians 4.30, John 14.26, 1 Corinthians 12.11, which shows that uh, the Holy Spirit does have personality because he is grieved by our sin. We see that he is a comforter, a helper. He is an individual, uh, is a person who teaches as well. And so like electricity is not grieved when you do something wrong. It just, it just zaps you. That's all it does. Um, but the Holy Spirit is grieved when we sin against him. So this highlights his personhood. So we see here that the Holy Spirit as well is defined just as the Father and the Son. Um, maybe we'll just pause here. Any questions, comments, clarifications? You don't want to yell at me? Make comments. So I have a um, wait, wait. So earlier when you were talking about Jehovah's Witnesses, you showed a slide like where we're talking about uh, their new world translation where it said um, all things were created, like all other things were created by him. No, not that one. It was the and the word was with God and the word was a God. Doesn't it seem like counterproductive that they're for the and they're saying that there's more than one God, even though they're monotheists. Oh, yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, great question. Uh, you broke up just slightly, but I think I got the gist of your question. It, is it counterproductive in John 1 1 for them to say a God if they're such strong monotheists, right? Is that the gist of your yeah. question? Yeah, 100%. That's a great question. That's a great, great point. Um, it, it is like, and that's kind of like uh, an illogical. Um, component of their translation is it kind of paints them into a corner because they don't want to say that Jesus is the God, that he's equal with the father in terms of essence. Um, so they change it, but then this has a ripple effect in the rest of scripture. Um, and so, yeah, it, it really does. And so if you, it, you can turn to a verse like John 17, three, um, where, uh, when Jesus is praying to the father and he says the only true God. And so like, you can ask them in a gentle way, in a kind way, not in a cheeky way, but you, this is where you're being conviction and you're being honest and you're going like, uh, 
which verse is right here? Is it the only true God in John 17, 3? Or is it John 1, 1, that Jesus is a God, one of many gods? And you can just let that sit for a minute and just see like, that's a bit of a problematic view that we have on this passage. And then you can kind of insert like, hey, no Greek scholar ever thinks that this interpretation of John 1, 1 is viable. Uh, yeah, so it's a great, great thought. Really good thought. So any other my, comments? I think someone else had a comment. Yeah, I did. Um, in my mind, I look at God as three beings because he has the son, Jesus, who came in the world to sacrifice himself for our sins, the Holy Spirit, which fills us once we confess our sins, and then God the Father, who is all the Almighty, the creator. And everyone says, Oh. Yeah, there's only one God, but that one God is uh, evenly split up into kind of three beings. But at the same time, all those three beings are still one God. And yeah, yeah. It's Sorry, little, go ahead. It's a little confusing to some people, but for me, it makes it a really easy process because a lot of times in the Bible, they'll say, oh, Jesus, they'll say the Holy Spirit, they'll bring up God. And I feel like a lot of times with a lot of other religions, that's where they get in with the oh, a god or multiple different gods. And that's why I just bring up the fact that he's kind of a three in one person. He's not just God. He's all time creator. He made everything. If if I just may like interject for um, a moment, I, I just have a question about the extent to which we are able to describe this to someone because all these verses are incredibly helpful and they definitely point to our doctrine and our dogma being correct as opposed to the jehovah's witness uh point of view but at the same time it just comes to a point where we as humans cannot fully grasp the the Trinity in its entirety, the idea of there being three beings, but it only being one. And so I just want to know at what point do we just have to, like you said, in um, uh, being candid in the sixth D, like we have to know at what point we are reaching our, our limit and when we're stepping out of bounds into unknown waters. I just want to know when that is. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And both of those are, are great comments. Um, uh, I would say that you're hundred percent right. We, we cannot reach the point where we fully understand everything about the Trinity. Cause if we did like you'd be God because he's, he's infinite. Um, the way I, I think about it is, um, God has revealed who he is and has revealed the Trinity in scripture. So there is some level about the Trinity and about who he is that we can understand and we can believe in. But there is an element of of faith. What I think is important is that the um, the Trinity, even though it may not have any other parallels in, in in our world, it's not illogical. It might be supra logical. I don't know if that's even a word, but it's like it's still uh, viable, but it's not illogical. Um, and um, I had another point I wanted to add on there, and I forgot it already. Um, I'll think about it tonight at 3 a.m. Uh, <laughs> call us. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. I'll wake you guys up. Um, yeah, it'll come back to me at some point. Um, darn it. I can't remember what it was. It was a good, it was a good one. It was a zinger. Aww. Oh well. Uh, but yeah, you're hundred percent right. And being honest with that and just saying, like, you know, yeah, it is, it is hard. Oh, I remember what it is now. I remember. Yes, good. Um, is is this like the point I kind of lean into is that even though there is aspects of the Trinity that are very difficult for me to understand and to conceptualize, it seems clear to me, based on the evidence that I have in Scripture, that the Bible asserts two things, that there is one God, monotheism, and that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are God. So 
we can either assert one of two things. Either there's a contradiction in that, or in some way, they we have one God uh, revealed in three persons. Uh, and this is where the doctrine of the Trinity comes comes in and why the church has developed and articulated and defended the doctrine of the Trinity. Because I personally don't think there's contradictions in the Bible. And so this idea uh, that there's got to be a way to find that there's coherence between these statements, especially for individuals uh, as they are believing the Bible and writing the Bible, like in the New Testament, they would have been aware of those uh, uh, of the contradiction, if there was a contradiction, they're not saying two things out of the the same side of their mouth. And so, in what way can those two things be true? And in that sense, like, all right, I'm a, I'm having a hard time understanding the Trinity, but that's uh, what Scripture seems to be expressing. Does that make sense? Is that yeah, that absolutely. Sense? Awesome. It, it works in my mind, but weak-minded fool. So. I don't know if it works for anyone else, but yeah, good, good, good thought. Good question. Yeah. Very good. So good. Awesome. Any other questions, comments? This is great. You brought up the verse, uh, John 17, three, and it says, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. A lot of people don't understand that God sent his son for us to have eternal life. And if you look into other religions, they'll say differently. As you were saying, they'll say you'll have to work or you'll have to do something to earn that eternal life. And I've talked to Muslims. I've talked to a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they say a lot of different things. Like uh, they have to do a lot more than Christians, they don't just have to believe. They don't just have to confess their sins. They kind of have to work all day, 24-7, to get that eternal life. And yeah, it says it right here in the scriptures. All they have to do is read. But you also brought up the fact their Bibles, or not even their Bibles, their scriptures that they read are altered from ours from the original yeah and th that's the thing too like building on what we said earlier of like finding common ground is that even though there's times when there may be differences in how our bible reads versus their bible reads i you can look at like a lot of these other verses that shows the love and the compassion um that God has for us the freeness of salvation that he wants us to enjoy that eternal life and not by our own work, but by the work of Christ. Like that's all in their Bible and uh, that's all in our Bible. And that just shows um, how beautiful Christ is and how wonderful he is. So yeah, great, great point. Appreciate that. It's good. Okay. So we've got, we've covered the deity of the son, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Um, Thinking of like, is this polytheism or is this monotheism? Um, the Trinity is so hard. I think I already, but in going with only two topics, I already bit off more than I can chew here. So I, I don't want to go too fast, but I kind of want to just move along. So if 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 it, if the Bible is just asserting polytheism, then the New Testament authors would have had to clearly and completely reject Judaism and the Old Testament because the Old Testament is clearly monotheistic. And so if the Bible, if the New Testament and the, the apostles were understanding that there were multiple gods, that you have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, and they're separate gods, there's not one God, they would have had to get rid of and reject the Old Testament. But instead, they hold to the Old Testament. They don't get rid of their, their Judaism. They don't get rid of their Jewish identity or their Jewish theology. They still retain it. So polytheism was something within the Roman culture, and that they resisted, and that they fought against. Um, and it's the New Testament and the early church, they clung to the monotheism, but where that, that monotheism is expressed as being one God, and the Father, the Son, and the, and the Spirit being that God. One essence, one nature, three persons within that essence and nature. Um, one aspect here, and this is, um, I really am dependent on this aspect 
of of uh, the Trinity from Michael Reeves in his book, Delighting in the Trinity. Small book, easy to read. Got to get it. Fantastic book. Very devotional, very helpful, but also great, great insights. And I think C.S. Lewis talks about this as well in Mere Christianity. But he talks about and develops this uh, view of the Trinity from John, 1 John 4, 8, where it says that God is love. And so if God is love, he must have had someone to love from all eternity, right? If it's just the Father, if it's just this one singular person that has ever existed, and he is love from all of eternity, how can he be love? Because love, he's not just loving yourself, that's narcissistic, that love goes out, right? So this idea that God is love necessitates that it's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are mutually loving one another for all of eternity. And this is what Reeves points out from passages like John 17 or 24 and other passages, that this love that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit mutually have for one another for all of eternity overflows in creation, in creating the world. It's not just like, let's create beings that will serve us, but it is, it's a full outflowing of their love. And then when that corrupt, when that creation is Deface that they go to redeem it, that Christ comes to redeem it, and then the Spirit comes to sanctify us as well. So this aspect, of, just from that one verse of God is love, shows that there's kind of a Trinitarian logic to that idea of the essential identity and nature of who God is. So um, that's one, that's the first issue regarding the Trinity with Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, now the second issue, the remainder of our Time, the little bit that we have, we're going to look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how this contrasts with what we see in Islam. Now, um, in Islam, it uh, comes after Christianity um, in the in the five hundreds. Um, yeah, in the five hundreds, and uh, you have this line in the Quran, um, and um, it says this. This is from uh, chapter one twelve uh, or a surah, which is our chapters, what we think of as a chapter, it says this, say, he is Allah, the one and only, Allah, the eternal, absolute, he begetteth not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like unto, unto him. So we see that in within the Quran itself, uh, the holy book of Islam, that there is this um, uh, resistance and um, uh, outright um, disagreement with Christianity about the nature of who God is, that God or Allah um, does not have a son. I mean, uh, and it's, it's pretty clear. He begetteth not, nor is he begotten. Uh, that's like direct, seems like it's directly going against something like John 316 or something like that. Um, and so part of the view that Islam has about Jesus and about Allah um, is that they're strict monotheists as well, that it is only Allah, and that Jesus is not the Son of God, is not um, uh, associated with God. He is merely a prophet. Uh, now, along with this, they'll, they'll assert that Jesus did not die on the cross and was obviously was not raised from the dead either. So if we can show to our, our Muslim friends that there is good evidence that Jesus did rise again from the dead, this can show, this does show, that Jesus is not uh, only a prophet, is that he is more than a prophet. And so then we can begin to evaluate his claims. Who did he actually claim to be in the New Testament? Um, and uh, we can see that his claims to be God that we see in the New Testament uh, are vindicated by the fact that he was raised from the dead. So this is the linchpin of Christianity. This is the core of what makes Christianity Christianity is the fact that Jesus did rise again from the dead. Now, how can we show um, from the text uh, and historically um, that Jesus did rise again from the dead? Now, um, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little wary of using the word prove. Like, I don't think we can prove 100% um, a doubt that Jesus did indeed rise again from the dead, but I think we can um, do it with with reasonable with with reasonable. How's that line go? With with uh, um, yep. 
we can be sure um, that Jesus did rise again from the dead. Um, and so all of the evidence leads us to the only conclusion that makes sense of that Easter morning is that Jesus did rise again from the dead. So one of the ways that I think is helpful in thinking about this is the, the word POW, P-O-W. And this is an acronym. Uh, and I get this from a, a, a really good scholar. His specialty is in the resurrection um, uh, named Michael Lacona. He's, a, you've got a, um, what am I called? A link there to a, a YouTube video, very short 10 minute YouTube video where he goes over this, but he's a great, great scholar. He's got one of the top books on the resurrection and he uses this acronym POW, Paul, Oral Tradition and Written Text. And so these are kind of like the three points of evidence for why we can uh, believe in the resurrection. The first one, Paul, we'll deal with that one first, is that Paul is not a friend of Christianity. He persecuted Christians, and yet he has a dramatic transformation. Um, he is not friendly to Christianity. He is antagonistic, strongly antagonistic, and yet he uh, sees on the road to Damascus, he sees the risen Jesus. Uh, and his whole life is transformed. Now, he writes this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Uh, and, and what we'll see here, well, I'm going to read it first, and then I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. I'm get ahead in, getting ahead of myself. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and then verse four, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Now, what's important for us to note here in this passage, 1 Corinthians 15, three through four, Paul is telling us, he's, he's, he's not just making up, what can I say about Jesus? He is preserving an early Christian tradition or creed. So verses three and four is something that is much earlier than Paul. And he is writing it down for us. It's almost as like if we were to, um, I don't know, we were going to write a book and we were going to include a quote from Star Wars or from Lord of the Rings. And you could say like, see, this clearly predates JC. It's happened in the 70s from the Star Wars or whenever Lord of the Rings was written. You know, so you get my point, um, hopefully. And, and so when Paul writes 1 Corinthians, he is writing in the mid 50s. Um, you know, probably around 55, 54, something around there. And um, so that's quite early. And this is actually the earliest piece of evidence that we have in any text, including the New Testament. This is the earliest piece of evidence that we have for the resurrection is um, uh, this statement that Paul gives us in 1 Corinthians. But it is, it is even earlier than when Paul writes it in 1 Corinthians 15 in the mid 50s. It's earlier than that. It predates it. So this is a very early, early statement uh, and confession by the early church about um, what has happened to Christ, that he died for our sins and that he was raised on the third day. And this is based on eyewitness testimony. When you read further in 1 Corinthians 15, we see that Paul lists several different eyewitnesses, Peter, the apostles, 500 at one time. Then he says, even myself, I saw the risen Lord. And so this is not just based on hearsay. He's basing this on people who actually saw these things. And these are people who are still alive that could be uh, approached and said and asked about what they had witnessed. So this is extremely early testimony. So the point why this is early is, is, is so important because if it's so early, you don't have this long period where things can get garbled or uh, developed and morphed into uh, some crazy story. It's, if it's early, it preserves its viability. And since there's still eyewitnesses when Paul is writing with this, you have people that could step forward and say, hey, I was there. Paul's a, Paul's a liar. There's no way that happened. And I, I totally saw it differently. He, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. So uh, Paul's testimony is extremely helpful for us in uh, preserving and, and uh, the earliness 
of the, the um, trajectory of Christianity and the earliness of the belief of the resurrection. This is not something that develops hundreds of years later uh, in Christianity. It is an essential feature of the earliest part of Christianity. Now, along with this, you have written texts. Um, jumped over uh, oral tradition. Uh, oral tradition as well. The, 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 there we go. I forgot to highlight that. That's our O. So we have Paul, his own testimony. We have Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, preserving this. And then we have the oral tradition within there that dates back. We think of oral tradition as like a telephone game um, that is highly corruptible, but that's just not how oral tradition works in the ancient world. A lot more that could be said about that, but I'm going to move move forward. High, oral tradition is highly stable in uh, the ancient world. And so we see that pre being preserved in Paul's writing with this creed. And then our W, so we have POW, P-O-W, uh, our W is written text. Our earliest text that we have after Peter's, uh, excuse me, Paul's uh, preservation of this creed in 1 Corinthians 15 are the Gospels themselves. And while there are differences in how the Gospels present the story of Jesus, of what they include or not include, and how they include things in the arrangement, all agree that Jesus died and was raised from the dead. That is, everyone agrees with that, and everyone spends a significant portion of time dealing with those issues. All are in absolute agreement. So this is an essential feature of early Christianity is that Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, all of early Christians believe in the resurrection. So the question is, what caused that belief? See, you can't just say like, no, it didn't happen. And you can say that, you can believe that if you really want to, but you, you have this evidence that if early Christianity believed in the resurrection, why? You have to come up with the mechanism. What was the cause for that belief? So we have four things here that we can point to of reasons why the cause for the resurrection happened and why it's the actual resurrection. So this is an important point to highlight for your Muslim friend, because they'll say that Jesus didn't actually die, that he um, just like showed up and uh, everyone thought that he'd actually been raised from dead, but in reality, he didn't actually die. Um, it's important for us to note that the Romans are especially good at crucifixion and at torturing and killing individuals. Uh, it was like a science, a twisted science to them. And um, they would not allow someone to escape from, from this sort of shameful death sentence. Now, on top of this, maybe he was on the cross and maybe he passed out. And they thought he died, but he didn't actually die. And he like revived in the tomb. Um, uh, Josephus, the ancient author Josephus, writing about the same time as the New Testament, he describes that there of all the, the thousands and thousands of people who were crucified by Rome, he gives the testimony that there, that there were only three individuals that he saw um, that um, survived crucifixion. Um, Three were taken down from their crosses, and uh, of those three, only one actually survived. They were all given the best medical treatment that Rome could provide, but two of the three um, didn't 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 survive. Only one uh, actually survived a crucifixion. So, like the likelihood, the fact is of Jesus surviving a crucifixion and then reviving and be totally like fine and skipping down the street afterwards just doesn't seem to be the most likeliest scenario uh, describing the resurrection. So he actually died and he, and he is buried in a known tomb. If, if um, the disciples go and they hear of Jesus' resurrection and they go to the empty tomb and they make the wrong turn, and they go to the wrong tomb and they, go, and they see it's empty. Look, he's been raised, but they're just looking at the wrong tomb. All the Roman guards and all the Pharisees had to do would go like, you made a wrong, wrong turn. turn. It's a right, not a left. Look, here's Jesus' body but they don't do that. So this highlights the fact that the tomb was empty um, uh, that Easter morning. Now, I love this, this piece of evidence here as well, is that the first witnesses on the scene are Jesus's women followers. Now, the ancient Rome 
and um, Judy uh, and Israel in this time is uh, exists in a very um, patriarchal society, and uh, women's testimony was heavily discounted. Um, and so, if you were going to make up a religion, make up a, an absurd claim and an important claim um, about someone's being raised from the dead, and you wanted the most legitimacy in your culture, you would choose a male uh, witness. But yet the gospels don't do this. All of the gospels, all of them doggedly assert that Christ uh, was, that the empty tomb was discovered by the uh, women disciples of Jesus. The first witnesses are his women followers. And so we have this like beautiful picture of, of Christ's elevation of these women um, and as them being the first, the first people on the scene. But also if this was like, you were trying to throw this under, uh, uh, throw this under the rug, you would not, you would not do this. You would not elevate them as the chief witnesses, but all the gospels assert it was the women who were first. And it even like plays against that patriarchal mindset of like the disciples, the ones who should have believed in um, in the resurrection, they don't get it. They discount the uh, witness of the women. Uh, they are the ones who truly believe. So this gives us a hint that this is uh, has some uh, veracity to it. Then we have multiple witnesses and multiple appearances. It's not just like one guy or a couple of guys who did have this experience, but that many people, all of Jesus's disciples, many other of his followers. Uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 that 500 people at once um, uh, saw Jesus. Uh, and it's not like a mass hallucination. Um, that's not really how hallucinations work. Um, uh, it's an individual thing. So they, see, they are seeing something real. And then finally, um, the final kind of point that we can uh, pin here is that the disciples' belief is against their presuppositions. It's not like once Jesus died, they were psyching themselves up like, yes, three more days, 72 hours until we get to see Jesus raised from the dead. Isn't this going to be great? Um, that, that's, not, that's not the case at all. Uh, in ancient Judaism, there was a belief about resurrection among in, in some circles of Judaism. But that resurrection was a belief that G, that uh, individuals would be raised from the dead at the end of time, not anytime soon. It's when at the end of time, when God in, uh, brought into the eternal state and established his kingdom at the end of time. And so there was no thought, several scholars point this out, there was no thought that um, someone would be raised from the dead for three days right after um, the, the um, Jesus's death. So the expectation, the presupposition of the disciples is that when Christ died, it was over. They were utterly shattered. And so they're not just psyching themselves up, waiting for his resurrection. They were not expecting his resurrection. It was not in their worldview in any way. And so uh, the fact that Jesus did rise again and that they strongly asserted that he did rise again against their presupposition is a strong evidence for the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Now, the best re the resurrection is, in my view, the best explanation of the events on that Easter morning. You don't have to believe that he actually rose again, but it seems to be the best explanation for those events. You have to say, all right, something happened that morning. What caused that event? It seems that the best explanation is the fact he rose again. So, um, yeah, that's the resurrection. Um, yeah. Any questions, comments? I have a comment. So Jesus um, says to the Jews when, I think it's in the book of John, he goes into the temple and says, pretty much take it down and destroy the temple. And they go and say, it's a, uh, and he says, he says he's going to bring it, resurrect it in three days. And he was talking about his body. He was not talking about But they didn't know that. And they built. And three days later, the temple's still standing, but Jesus is dead and he resurrects himself. And then they actually see what he means. 
because there's he was talking about his body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's kind of what it kept reminding me of when we kept talking about uh, the three days. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it is in I, the, this the yeah you're hundred percent right. Is that um, in the uh, reality of Christ's res resurrection that everything about Scripture about Jesus gets reconfigured for the disciples and they see everything in completely um, new light and what he said and what he did and you see that even in like the Gospel of Luke um, with the with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. That, that they're like, didn't our hearts burn within us? And then 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 their eyes are opened when he uh, breaks open the bread. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so now, now they, they see Jesus in completely new light. Yeah, that's good. That's real good. Thank you. Um, I have one, and I don't mean to be overly cynical, but you started this section on Islam and resurrection by um, pulling a quotation uh, from the Quran, which says, you know, Allah be God, if not. And I don't believe the Quran. Why don't I believe the Quran? Because I'm not a Muslim. I'm a Christian. I think the Quran has no authority. I don't think that it is the inspired work of God. I think that the Bible is the inspired work of God. When I talk to a Muslim, the reverse is going to be true. If I pull a bunch of quotes from the Bible, despite however much I may believe it and know it to be the true, perfect, divine work of God, they don't. I'm assuming they don't. They're Muslims. They believe on the authority of the Quran, that is their holy book. So I just, before I even start pulling quotes from the Bible to support the resurrection of Jesus, how, how am I able to actually give the Bible its due and that I can pull quotes from it of which to speak on and that they actually hold water? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a really key question too. Um, two two things that we can say. Number one is that let let's just let's take away the um, inspired nature of scripture, uh, and let's just treat the gospels as uh, historical documents. Right? We don't have to give it any sort of theological component. Let's just treat it as these are testimony of individuals from that time period. If you do that. I mean, the Gospels and 1 Corinthians 15, it is the earliest piece pieces of evidence that we have for Christianity and for the resurrection um, and about who Jesus is. Like, we know very little about who Jesus is without the Gospels. They are by far um, the earliest piece of documents, you know, irrespective of whether they're inspired, just that they're the documents about Jesus that we have. Um, and so that gives us really good, um, like, uh, it, basically all the other things that we have about Jesus come from much later periods where, where we are separated from the eyewitness testimony and the eyewitness, eyewitnesses themselves. And so there's a much stronger separation and distance from the actual events and individuals involved. The gospels are the closest thing that we got going on. So even if we don't treat it as as um, scripture, um, we can treat them as historical documents, which is what how many scholars will treat them. Not all, but but many. The second thing that we could say specifically to uh, our Muslim friends, and because uh, many Muslims um, uh, will will assert that the New Testament uh, and the Gospel specifically have been corrupted, um, that. Um, uh, even the, that they are, uh, there's a long tradition that the scripture, the, the, the Bible, um, is, was originally, um, uh, part of the long tradition of, um, uh, like the Abrahamic faith from which, um, uh, Muhammad and, um, uh, Islam descends from, but over time, each component of the Bible was corrupted and then a new revelation is given. So you have the Torah was given that was corrupted. So then you have 
uh, uh, David coming in and you have new revelation given. You have that is corrupted. Then you have the New Testament coming in and, and uh, giving new revelation. That becomes corrupted. And then the Quran comes in and that is established as the actual revelation from God. Um, so that's kind of the thinking um, that the Bible was originally um, from God, uh, from Allah, but uh, has since been corrupted. Now we can point to the fact that um, um, while there are some differences in the manuscripts that we have for the New Testament, we have the whole of the New Testament and we can reconstruct the entirety of the New Testament um, via many manuscripts, very good, high quality and early manuscripts that predate uh, Islam. So Islam uh, originates in the mid uh, 500s, I believe, uh, maybe the 600s. Maybe I'm getting my, anyways, five or six hundreds. Um, but we have the, the text of the New Testament, the complete whole New Testament, very good manuscripts uh, from the four hundreds. Um, so even if we're going to say that, um, uh, really what we're going to, how do I want to phrase this? Um, if you're going to say that the New Testament is corrupted, when was it corrupted? Because the Quran never actually says that it, that the New Testament was corrupted. It's later just the common Muslim belief um, about the New Testament. You'd have to say it would be after um, the after the fact of the writing of the Quran, because it never says the New Testament's been corrupted. And so, if we have manuscripts um, of the New Testament, the whole New Testament that predate the Quran and predate Islam. This shows, and that's what we're basing our New Testament off, and the stories of Jesus and the resurrection and what he says about himself. This shows that um, the New Testament has not been corrupted. So there's a lot more we could say about that. Um, there's a lot more to it, but I don't know. Does that make sense at all? Is that? That's actually clear? very good. It's very good. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's not a dumb question, but. Uh, are there documents that predate the Quran? Because I know it was like not that long after the Christ's death and everything. New Testament documents? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so are, are you talking about New, New Testament documents? Are there New Testament documents yeah. before the Quran? Yeah. Yeah, great question. Yes, there's there's quite a few actually. And this is something that is somewhat unique among um, manuscripts in the ancient world. Um, uh, I, I, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it's somewhere around 150 manuscripts. We have 150 manuscripts. Some of these are of the whole new Testament. Some are just like itty bitty scraps and they just got a, a couple of verses on them, but we have over 150 manuscripts that are within the first 300 years after the writing of the new Testament. So somewhere between 100 AD to 400, 450 AD all of which is before the Quran. Um, the typical um, ancient document, uh, the amount of manuscripts that it has in that 100 in that 300 year period is zero. So it's unique that the New Testament has uh, such early and well-written manuscripts um, uh, in a, at such an early date. And then we have many manuscripts that uh, come down uh, from that period, but are later. And so we have a wide range of, of more manuscripts after it as well. So all that to say is we have lots of textual evidence for um, how we can reconstruct the New Testament, all of that, uh, or many of which predates uh, Islam and the Quran. So the assertion that the New Testament has been corrupted um, uh, uh, at the time of Islam, uh, the arrival of Islam or, or afterwards, um, just, just, uh, that's not what we're basing our evidence. We're dating on pre Quranic, uh, textual evidence. Um, Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I have, I have a question. If this doesn't directly relate to Islam, if anything, it, it's more towards like agnostics and atheists. And I don't know if this is just one question, but it's kind of, it's all related. So I, I, tend to hear people say like, um, oh, the Bible, right? they always question the authenticity of the testimonies which are in the Bible, like the Gospels, for example. And then also I hear a question or like an assertion that, oh, um, the Gospels were written like decades after the events. And so these aren't valid testimonies or 
something like if I can my brain can work correctly right now. Um, how do we like how could the canonicity of the Bible be hundred percent determined, and how can we uh have how can anyone have faith in it? Because um, for all we know, something like the Book of Enoch or the Apocrypha could be just as valid. So how would you um, how would you like sum that up? Basically, spark notes to answer that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Great question. Great question. I I love those questions. Um, yeah, I really I really resonate with that. Um, so I um I think you got a couple of questions there. So I'm gonna deal with yeah. them in, in turn. So the, the first one that I heard, um, my internet's a little sketchy. So the first one I heard um, was, um, how can we trust the gospels if they're written several generations or several decades after the fact? Um, one of the reasons why, um, one of the things that we need to remember is that even though the, gos the gospels are written several decades afterwards, so Jesus dies somewhere around 30 AD. Scholars say it's either 27 AD, 30 AD, or 33 AD. Those are the three options. Um, let's just put the middle. Let's say it's 30. Almost all scholars agree that the Gospel of Mark is the very first gospel that's written. And um, uh, we, scholars debate the, the timing, but most scholars agree that it's written somewhere around 70 AD, Some probably right before it. So maybe 68, somewhere in there. So we're looking at... Um, we're looking at somewhere 35 to 40 years after the events of Jesus's life and death, we have the first gospel being written down. Everyone agrees on that. Doesn't matter if you're atheist, agnostic, Christian, everyone agrees on that. Um, so uh, that's that from our perspective, that seems to be uh, a large distance. Um, two things need to be mentioned. It's still within the frame, uh, the time frame of the eyewitnesses. Um, Eyewitnesses are still alive. And so even though there is a large time gap, that doesn't mean that that testimony is uh, made up uh, or just invented. Um, really what we're looking for, if, for something to be like uh, invented of these like uh, mythical stories, you need a much longer time period than the 40 years that we, 40 year window that we have uh, between the events of, the, of Jesus' life and death and the writing of the Gospel of Mark. Um, so that's actually a shorter time period than we give it credit. Um, second of all, it's not just that the events happened and then they are written down in 30 AD and then they are written down in 70 AD. In that in-between period, you have something called oral tradition. And when we think of oral tradition, we think of like the telephone game where I say something to someone who then whispers it to someone else who whispers to something else, and then it just gets garbled along the way. And that's not how oral tradition works. Oral tradition works in a communal environment with individuals who are like well invested in preserving the stories and the teachings of an individual. So the example I like to use is um, when you're hanging out with your friends, you have that like favorite film that you like to quote. I have a friend of mine, she loves uh, Nacho Libre. And so I try to be nice. And, and uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie. It's totally ridiculous. It's hilarious and ridiculous. Um, and so I try to be nice and like quote, quote the movie with her when, when I see her occasionally. And she just kind of rolls her eyes at me and then corrects my lame quotations. And for whatever reason, she's just like super invested in. That's a, that's a form of oral tradition where you have someone who's heavily invested in, you have a community who's invested in it, and then someone who's heavily invested in it, who seeks to correct and uh, preserve what um, the, the, the saying is. That's what's happening in that 40-year time gap that you have individuals within the church who saw these things, who told their stories, and then who sought to preserve and to correct when someone went off the rails. Like, no, 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 it didn't happen like this. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus did. So in that um, time period, we don't have a long enough time period for uh, like mythical corruption to happen. And we have that preservation of the oral tradition until it's crystallized in written form during the time of the eyewitnesses. So um, that's kind of your first question. Does that, does that make sense? Any questions? I know that breeze through that really fast, but... Um, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. Um, your, your second question about canonicity. Yeah. Um, um, really, it's it's a byproduct 
of um, the earlier point of that we have eyewitness testimony contained in these texts. Um, and so what the um, early church looked at, they were looking for kind of three main things. Um, it's not just a free-for-all whose books were most popular, um, who was the, the the best, or who was uh, who sold the most books or something like that, uh, who, who had the most power, which is very um, uh, dominant view in scholarship, uh, that different Christian groups had more power and they had their own version of Christianity. But with that um, oral tradition being preserved, um, th that essential feature that Jesus is, is God, that he died and then he rose again from the dead, is at its earliest point in Christianity. Um, like with Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians 15, he's writing that in 50, in the 50s, mid 50s, and then he's preserving earlier text. So th this is something that's extremely early. Um, so this is creating a trajectory about what is the essential aspects of Christianity. So if you have a document that comes along and says, no, 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 Jesus didn't rise again from the dead, or Jesus is not God, then that would automatically be discounted because it disagrees with the core aspects of Christianity. So early Christians, when they were considering books, which books were, were to be uh, considered as scripture in the canon, they looked at three things. Uh, was it written by an apostle? Did it conform with um, the rule of faith or the essentials of Christianity? And was there widespread acceptance of these things? That's what they look for. And if it didn't have those things, they did not accept it into the canon. So something like the book, uh, the, the first Enoch, um, which is slightly a different uh, set of books, um, does not adhere to those. Something like the Gospel of Thomas, not written by an apostle, even though it says it's from Thomas, it's not actually from Thomas. It's written much later. Uh, and it gives a very different presentation of who Jesus is. Uh, so this is reasons why it was not accepted. It's not just like, eh, we don't like it, or eh, it's not popular enough. Um, yeah, so those are some reasons why we have the New Testament. Does that make sense? Any clarification? Yeah, that's a really good, uh, that's a really good way to sum it up. Thank like, you. I'm sorry, my brain is working right now. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Well, sorry to keep you guys so long. Sorry to be long winded. Uh, any other questions, comments? So I had one thing. Uh, you said that the Muslims think that the, our scriptures are corrupted, right? Uh, even if we talk about the, you know, the early documents, would they not say that those were corrupted? Can you say that one more time? The, the early... You know, the, how we said we have like earlier texts on the Quran, right? Would they not say that those are corrupted too? Um, the the yeah the I, I see what you're saying the earlier text of the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it seems as if there's some evidence in the Quran. I forget the passage. Um, that seems to suggest um, that the New Testament has not been corrupted at the time of the writing of the Quran. Um, so this is, it, it seems as if it's, it happens either like right at the time of the Quran, if, if the corruption happened, it happens right at the time of the Quran or at, um, afterwards. Um, but if we have these manuscripts that are much, much earlier, then that would predate the time of that corruption, if you will. I don't know if that makes sense yeah. or not. Yeah. I think if you like, uh, if you go online and you just find what the Quran has to say about the Bible, uh, it seems to speak well of it, uh, and it wouldn't be yeah. speaking well of it at that time if it had already been corrupted. I believe there is a passage in the in the Quran. I don't think it's a hadith. I think it's in the Quran, um, where it it says like, if you doubt these things are true, that God, that Allah is speaking through Muhammad the prophet. Uh, it says, like, go to uh, the Jew and go to the Christian and to, and to confirm that these things are written in uh, in their scriptures. Um, and that, I think that's an earlier period um, of Muhammad's life um, and the rise of Islam. But I believe that is in, in the Quran. Uh, wow. So it, it does not seem to speak like in a condemning tone towards scripture. Yeah. 
At least there are not always. Don't they call us the people of the book? Yes. Yeah. Which I love that term, actually. I think that's such a great term. So they wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't speak in any kind of positive way about the book if it had already been corrupted. So it seems like the corruption that they claim happened happened after the Quran. Well, JC, uh, not that we want to end it, but we must end it because the women are waiting. We have a meal waiting. Meal for us. You got to get going then. That's important. <laughs> Maybe next year you venture this way and you do this lesson in person uh, and just enjoy the fellowship with these uh, men. Yeah, I would love it. I'd love it. Thanks for letting me be with you guys tonight, though, even virtually. It's great. Hanging with you and talking with you, and thanks for putting up with me. All right, do you mind closing in prayer? Sure, absolutely. Father, thank you so much um, for your love. We thank you for the fact that you are a God, that you not only are our God, but that you are wonderful and beautiful. Uh, you are reliable. We thank you and we praise you, Father. Um, I thank you for uh, my brothers. Um, I thank you for my friends, that just that you administer to them. Draw us closer to yourself. Help us not to uh, turn from you. Help us not to turn to ourselves, but help us turn towards you and that we would rest in you, Father. Father, uh, as we just think about sharing our faith and knowing our faith and, and sharing with others, we pray that we would not become arrogant, that we would not um, be full of ourselves and just think that we know it all and just look down on others, but that we would um, know, want to know you better and want to share you more because of how beautiful that you are. Um, I thank you, Father. I thank you for um, my fellow believers and just pray that you bless them, bless the rest of the week and time at the conference. And um, yeah, we just thank you that we could be together and um, we just pray that you'd bless their time and draw draw them closer to yourself. And I uh, pray for the other speakers as they be with them, as they uh, minister. And uh, we just love you, Lord. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I love you.